This week on Down to Earth, a flat pack emergency shelter for Syrian refugees. Iraq trials a solution that incorporates the very best of Swedish design. What we see here is a prototype. It is designed this way, like an IKEA bookshelf, to be easy to transport and to be easy to set up in the field. There's 45 million refugees and displaced people around the world. Many of them live in tents, not just for months, but years. When it's windy or raining, we're afraid. We're scared and we don't sleep until the morning. Today, dozens of architects compete for the best design. But there's no such thing as a perfect shelter. The ideal shelter is your own house when you go back home. This week we're down to earth in northern Iraq, 160 kilometres from the border with Syria. Every week thousands of Syrians flee their homeland and end up mostly in camps like this one here in the region of Kurdistan. None of the 13,000 people who live here know how long they'll stay, surviving in flimsy tents that offer little privacy or protection. But a few lucky families have been given a world first chance to try a flat pack refugee shelter that some might just consider a house. On refugee housing unit, we're using panels and not the fabric canvas. They're lightweight, around 1.8 kilo, same materials as you find in packaging or in car interiors. Protects from the heat and gives a better privacy. On top of it, we have a solar panel. It is big enough you know, to charge a light, to light through the night and to charge your cell phone. Other than that, we are having you know, ventilations, doors and windows, just in any house. Johan sells the house well because it's his creation, imagined 3,000 kilometres away in Stockholm, Sweden. What we see here is a prototype. It is designed this way, like an IKEA bookshelf, to be easy to transport and to be easy to set up in the field. So we have connectors, we have some pipes and a bunch of wires. Johan's project was financed by the IKEA Foundation together with the UN's Refugee Agency. Three years of development and an investment of 3.3 million euros. Twelve of the units were built here in Iraq last year, while others are being tested in Ethiopia. This is Johan's first visit to the camp, three months after they were installed. Hello. Long enough for the families living inside to give feedback on what's working and what's not. The product is not fully ready yet. We are still working on it. Your input on this is, is very helpful and crucial for us in completing the design. Yeah? The negatives, what, what are the main issues? These are the most important for us. Yeah? <laughs> I can show you. The last time it rained, the water came in here, through the holes. You can see where there are screws. If you put something plastic in there, it could stop the water from coming in and solve the problem. With no job and no way to feed his family, Riyadh fled Syria as part of a massive exodus of Kurds from the war-torn country. Along with his family, he brought his physically disabled mother. It was because of her handicap that they were chosen to trial these shelters after six months in a tent. I saw they were building 12 of these shelters and I was hoping to get one. Every day I'm so thankful I was given one. I feel really lucky. For the first time in my life, I feel lucky. This shelter is better because at least there's a door. And if we have people from the camp who come to visit, they can even sleep over a night or two. Here I feel like it's a home. I'm happy here, not like when I was in the tent. The unit is designed to last for at least three years. For the moment, each prototype costs more than 5,000 euros, but Yoan's target is 700 euros approximately double the price of a tent. Yon, this is your first time on the site here in Iraq. What are the people here telling you? Well, yeah, what we hear is that people are actually perceiving uh, the shelters as a home, as a house. And this is due to simple things that, that they're tall, you can stand upright into them, 
They have, you know, thicker paneling walls, uh, which gives them more privacy. A door, which you can lock. These simple things, which I think makes a diff you know, important difference between just a shelter and uh, something that you can call home. Well, at the moment they're made by hand, but you want to produce them on a much larger scale. Yeah, exactly. As sure as we can, you know, be sure that they're performing as we want. Then we are, you know, of course, aiming at producing them at a high scale, so we can, you know, distribute them to, you know, the thousands of people who are in need of a shelter like this. At the same time, certain governments have been reluctant to even let you trial these shelters. Yes. Why is that? Uh, that is a, a very good question. The, the main issue we have is that it may be perceived as a permanent home. We may think that's a very good thing, but for governments and landowners, they may be concerned that these, you know, uh, the refugees will stay uh, forever for long. So it's, we are working very hard with you know, giving the performance of a permanent building, but still being temporary and being perceived as something temporary. Temporary or not, all homes need light. And this shelter is flooded with it thanks to the solar panels which provide eight hours of electricity each day. Oh, oh. On the other side of the camp, the rest of the refugees survive in remarkably different conditions. moment most refugees live in tents like this. Not only here in Iraq but all over the world 3.5 million people reside in this type of emergency shelter. The design hasn't had a major upgrade in decades and they don't last long, typically around six months. And yet certain refugees can live in camps for decades. Emmanuel Gignac has worked in all kinds of emergency settings. In each case, it's hard to beat tents in the first instance. They're quick and easy to assemble, provide basic protection, and at 350 euros each, relatively cheap. Tent is definitely the best item to use uh, for the emergency phase. However, it is a temporary shelter. Uh, it keeps people in a state of precarity. Uh, it, it, it can burn very easily and you need to replace it. So it's not meant to last forever. We give a tent for emergencies, first uh, couple of months. Uh, and then after that, we have to think of another uh, solution. Since arriving at the camp last year, this family has lived under a tent. The canvas was damaged during Iraq's harsh winter. They've already asked for a replacement. First, they gave us a military tent, but that got torn in strong wind. For seven months, we've had this one. It's cold in the evening because the zip is broken, and at night, we can't leave the heater on because we're scared that the tent will catch on fire. Sometimes I fix my tent after work. When I don't work, I spend a whole day fixing the tent. It's worth maintaining this tent, though, because imperfect as it may be, for now, that's all they've got. Sometimes water leaks inside the tent and it spreads and our furniture gets wet. When it happens, we're scared and we don't sleep until the morning. In the last storm, we didn't sleep at all because we went outside to help hold the tent down. Today, more than ever, the UN Refugee Agency is turning to technology to improve the lives of displaced people. 2012 saw the birth of an innovation division created specifically to scout out new ideas. And there's no shortage in a budding market focused on emergency settings, both natural and man-made. This here is the EDV-01, a futuristic Japanese creation designed to be assembled in four minutes with the press of a button. Two floors, a kitchen, bath, toilet. Price tag undisclosed. An Argentinian designer is behind the compact C-Max, a fold-out shelter that's raised from the ground. For around 2,000 euros, it can provide refuge for up to 10 people before being easily packed up and moved on. And this origami-inspired folded bamboo house was created in the wake of the 2008 China earthquake, a geometric structure hailed for its use of renewable materials. 
Very few of these prototypes have been tried on the field, which is why the Swedish project is one step ahead of the rest. Today, for the first time, UNHCR's Emmanuel Gignac has come to see the units fully assembled. Hey, hello. Hello, welcome. Oh. And this doesn't require any, any special tools to uh, no. set up? No, the, the tool we provide with it is a hammer. What are the next steps? One of the benefits yeah. is the refugees can build these shelters themselves. And then, of course, the testing very much. I think they're on the right track. I think it's, uh, that's what we're looking for, things that are simple uh, and yet uh, solid, uh, not costly, and, and you can build up yourself. These units are not a miracle solution, because a miracle solution doesn't exist. The ideal shelter is your own house when you go back home. But in the meantime, if we can offer something which is only a little more expensive than a tent, but which gives greater comfort over a longer period, that would be fantastic. The Iraq trial will have its final review in another three months. In the meantime, another one will start in Lebanon, after the government initially refused the project out of fear that better housing will encourage the Syrian refugees to stay too long.